What's up everybody, James Bushell here, and I want to welcome you to this video. Uh, if you are new to my channel, I do Game of Thrones videos, uh, the occasional movie review, the occasional television show review, but mostly a Song of Ice and Fire videos. Uh, today's video will be mostly based on the books from the series of A Song of Ice and Fire, with some specific show elements thrown into the mix. If you have not read all five books and do not want to be spoiled, you have been warned. So let's get into it. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Miss Helene May. A conversation I had with her in the YouTube comments uh, formed the basis of this video. So, a shout out to you, Helene May. Hopefully I did not say your name wrong. Uh, today's subject revolves around two particular polarizing characters who in my mind both get irrational amounts of hate. These two characters, of course, are the one true king of Westeros, Stannis of the House of Baratheon, and the other character would be the Khaleesi herself, the mother of dragons, Daenerys Targaryen. When I browse through particular A Song of Ice and Fire forums, almost every thread devolves into a Danny or Stannis hate thread. Uh, ironically, I notice that a lot of irrational Danny haters are ardent Stannis supporters, and the Stannis haters are huge Danny fans. Uh, as a disclaimer, I am not going to lie to you. I am a Stannis fan. He is my second favorite character behind Sir Davos Seaworth. Uh, that being said, I am not blind to his faults. I will bring them up. Like Stannis, I am honest, and will bring up both sides of the coin. Uh, at the end of this video, I will say whom I believe will be in better standing at the end of George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire, and whoever that person is will be declared the winner. Well, let's start with Stannis. Um, now, like I said, this is... 100% a breakdown of book Stannis. Now look, <laughs> I love Stephen Delane's performance as Stannis, but I thought he was perfect as Stannis. Unfortunately, the show writers are not perfect. So we can throw show Stannis into the trash can. Um, D&D themselves has said they were not Stannis fans, and it showed. Uh, I personally believe they went out of their way to really piss all over the character. Uh, sorry for my language, but that's how I feel. Uh, the scene that really showcases that is from Season 4, Episode 2, The Lion and the Rose, when they showed Stannis and Mel burning the Florence because they were blasphemous towards the lore by not denouncing the Seven and tearing down, tearing down their religious idols. Um, so what book was D&D reading? The same book where Stannis had many knights who practiced the Seven, who fought under him. The same book where he himself was a zealot or not a zealot, I should say, and question Relor and Mel all the time. Um, yeah, I don't know what book they were reading. It wasn't the one that I read, I don't think, but that being said, I want to ask you guys this question. Do you know how many people Stannis had burned in the books? Uh, I'll give you a second. Okay, yeah, the answer is five. Under his direct command, only Alistair Florent, Rattleshirt clambered his manse, and the three cannibals in his camp in the north were the only ones that burned under his command. Gunser Sunglass and Hubbard Rambleton's sons were burned by Solis, not Stannis, when Stannis was at the Blackwater. That being said, uh, they were burned for a reason, these people. Alistair Florent was trying to end Stannis' claim by selling off Shireen to Tywin Lannister. M Mance... It was Rattleshirt as Mance, but Mance was supposed to be was burned because he was deserter of the Night's Watch. Good old Honorable Ned, Ned Stark, would have executed Mance as well, albeit minus the fire, more ice through the neck. Uh, and the cannibal's self-explanatory eating people is bad. Now look, burning people in any capacity is not good. I understand that. But some people make it out like... Stannis is out here burning people left and right for shits and giggles. Well, that is simply not the case. So, I got that out of the way. Let's go on to the pros of Stannis Baratheon. First off, we've all heard this term, most Song of Ice and Fire fans, but he is the king who cared. The man who saved the Night's Watch and by proxy the North. The man who smashed the wildling host when all was lost. The only one of power to heed the call of the Night's Watch and save the realm. One of the most epic scenes from the books is John 10, A Storm of Swords, where John is sent by Alistair Thro uh, Thro Throne, 
Thorn, sorry about that, and uh, Jano Slint to go meet with Mance, essentially sacrifice himself and to save, you know, you cut the head off the snake, the snake dies. That's kind of the, the logic they were going with here. John would sacrifice himself to kill Mance. Because Mance is the one that brings the wildlings together. Now, when he's about to do this, <laughs> his sacrifice is unnecessary because Stannis, Mofo, and Baratheon, and his host of Mountain Knights come and save the Mofo and Day. <laughs> it is what it is. And it was like a, I don't know if any of you are wrestling fans, but it was like a WWE squash match, you know. The, the wildlings were no match for the, tra the, the trained Mountain Knights, and they got ate up. Harma Dog's uh, shed, her head, ended up on a pike, and the men were shouting Stannis. That's one of the most epic scenes in the books, the, the, that last chapter ending with the, the phrase Stannis, 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 and it's, you know, it's just a progressive thing. I still get goosebumps thinking about that scene. And that's when Stannis really became a favorite of mine. Uh, in the show, because I didn't actually read the books till after season two, but I b became a Stannis fan in season two uh, because of what happened at the Blackwater. Stannis, and this it's uh, it's different from the book and the show, obviously. But in the show, he was you know he had the sword and he was sitting at the edge of the boat when they were landed. He was the first one off. Uh, he was pulled out a sword and he was hacking people up left and right fighting to the bitter end until he had to be carried off the battlefield. Um, if I was a knight in his employ uh, at the Battle of the Blackwater and I saw my king, you no know, first one off the boat, hacking people up, I'd be, I'd be into it. You know, I'd, I'd want to fight for his cause. Of course, in the, sh in the book, he was more in the back and as a, as a brilliant military commander, but we'll get into that later. Uh, number two, people say he is too rigid, but he has made many compromises. Uh, I highly suggest uh, reading the Brendan B. Fish's blog on his complete analysis of Stannis Baratheon, a brilliant piece of work, one of my favorites. Um, and he showcases and you know the many instances where he's willing to bend the rules, because you know you remember Donald Noy saying uh, that Stannis was iron. You know he's he's strong, but he's you know he's he's brittle, or he's an iron will, but he's brittle, and he'll. He'll bend before he breaks. Or no, he'll break before he bends. Sorry about that. But his blog, you know, it brings up, and in, in Radio Westeros' Stannis episode, with Brendan B. Fish was on, they did a great job showcasing all the times that Stannis has gone against his rigid nature. You know, uh, you know, with the wildlings and the northern mountain clans, getting people onto his side, you know, the different things he had to do that he's done to be less rigid to do what needs to be done for him to get on the Iron Throne. So, moving on from that. Number three, he is one of the few people who recognize the true threat to the realm. This is a quote from the books. Uh, Storm of Swords, Chapter 78, Samwell 5. Demons made of snow and ice and cold, said Stannis Baratheon. The ancient enemy. The only enemy that matters. So, as you can see, the realm needs Stannis... Because no one else takes the other's threat seriously, other than the Night's Watch. And that's why he's the king that cared, because he does care. Anyway, moving on to number four. He does lack empathy. I'm not going to deny that. But he makes up for it with having two important virtues, honesty and justice. I mean, you also have to admire the fact that he will not brown nose to anyone. He will tell it like it is. He will not take crap, and he despises people who are trying to suck up to him. That's actually the thing I like most about him, because no one likes a kiss-ass. Stannis especially doesn't like kiss-asses, and it'll get you nowhere. So, he's also very lawful. He's not an evil person like people claim. And, of course, he isn't unintentionally hilarious. I mean, how many times have you read the, when you're reading the books, you're like, did he really just say that? I mean... <laughs> And, like, John doesn't know when he's japing at times, you know, it's just, I, I find that funny. But And who can forget him calling Wyman Manderley Lord Too Fat to Sit a Horse? One of the, you know, famous names of this, uh, of this series. Uh, moving on to number five, he's got an iron will. The Siege of Storm's End during Robert's Rebellion is one of my favorite, uh, favorite stories of, of that came out of, the, of Robert's Rebellion. You know, Stannis holding Storm's End with the, you know, the... 
the, the might of Highgarden besieged upon him. And with the help of Lord Davos smuggling in uh, salt beef and onions, they were able to hold out for a year. You know, they were eating mice, and it was just a bad situation, but he was determined to keep Storm, Storm's End. And of course, he was <laughs> shat on by uh, Robert Baratheon afterwards, but that'll be a video for a different day. Um, he's also a great military commander. How many people in this story can claim that they defeated Victorian Greyjoy in the Iron Fleet? I mean, Victorian Greyjoy I have, is a person I have a lot of respect for in the, in the books, and I view that as a great accomplishment. So, it just shows that how great of a military mind Stannis Baratheon in the books is. Not, you know, YOLO Stannis Baratheon at Winterfell with half his force gone and no siege weapons. That you no, know, not that Stannis Baratheon. We're talking about book Stannis Baratheon. Uh, now, before I get into the cons, I want to recognize the Shadow Baby stuff. And why I don't think it's a con that he used shadow magic to kill his brother. People always want to demonize Stannis for killing his brother. But Renly was, in my mind, an ambitious usurper with a worse claim than his brother. I mean, Stannis had a reason why he was going for the Iron Throne. Because... It was because because of his you know lawful and his dutiful nature, it was his by right. Renly was just making an ambitious power play for the Iron Throne. He had no claim. He had no right. He should have backed his brother and joined his cause. People always also forget the fact that Renly would have killed Stannis as well. That's that's plain as day. He would have killed him if he had the opportunity. So in my mind. Renly, and also you guys got to think about this. How many people were saved that day because of the Shadow Baby? They would have gotten into a bloody conflict. People would have died. Shadow Baby saves lives. Bottom line. So now we're going to move on to the cons. Now, I know some people are hardcore Stannis fans. I'm a Stannis fan, obviously. But some Stannis fans get it wrong when they say Stannis is a perfect person who can do no wrong. That's just not the case. Uh, my personal, my personal biggest problem with Stannis is the Red God. I mean, I don't like the fact that he wants to burn God's that he's burning that he has burned God God's woods, and even tells John that if he wants to be Lord of Winterfell, and he recognizes John Stark. He must burn down the Godswood outside of Winterfell. I you know I'm I'm uh, agnostic, but I am for religious freedom. I believe that when you destroy certain groups' religious idols, you're wiping away part of their cultural identity. I will get more into cultural identities when we get down to Danny, but you know I just believe that I just didn't like the burning of the Godwoods because that's a, a different culture's means of of worship, and I believe in equality, religious equality, even though I'm not religious myself. Um, another con for Stannis is that he lacks empathy. There's no way around it. It's the truth. He's kind of a dick. <laughs> and I mean, you know, I like him because, you know, I like when I watch films and TV shows, I kind of gravitate towards the stern, badass, you know, fighter type. So I, that's what I found that saw in Stannis. He was not really a fighter, but he's just kind of a, a stern mofo that don't take no shit. That's the kind of character I like. And I totally understand how he rubs people the wrong way. You know, I mean, that's just the bottom line. He's, I know he's going he's gonna to rub people the wrong way. I'm, I'm not going to get angry at you for it because I totally see why. If I was transported somehow to a song, you know, to Westeros, and they said, hey, you can, you can have a drink with anyone in the world of A Song of Ice and Fire, Stannis would not be even close to being on my top, like, 40 list of people I want to have a drink with. You know, I can think of a lot more people I'd have a drink with. Davos being one, Salador Sand, he'd be fun to have a drink with. But Stannis, no, he's not. He, he's not on my list. So that's that. Uh, that being said, that kind of concludes the section that I want to talk about Stannis. Now let's take a look at Danny. Now I do think Danny gets untreated fairly by a lot of fans. Uh, I've heard crazy things that they think like she's the personification of evil. I do not believe that at all. I believe that in her heart she is a good person. I just don't agree with the choices she has made. So let's get into it. Uh, I'll start with Danny's cons. And for me, that is her decision to try and conquer all of Slaver's Bay. Now look, obviously I'm not pro-slavery. 
You know, let, let's get this let's get this straight. I'm not not a pro slavery. Uh, I, but I feel like a civilization has to make their own choices. Like, look at the backlash that she's received from the people that she's conquered. Uh, the stuff that's happening that happened in Astapor, and how uh, Yunkai is starting. You know, the, this whole battle of the battle of fire is happening because of her actions in Slaver's Bay. Uh, I believe that the Gaskari should have evolved from within. I think civilizations need to evolve from within. Eventually, there would have been revolution to end slavery. It would have been handled internally, and then afterwards there would have been peace, to an extent at least. Uh, Danny, however, invaded a civilization and took it over. In my eyes, that makes her, you know, makes her a conquering dictator. I mean, she—that's what she is—is is a conquering dictator. Uh, I believe she's a well-intentioned one, but she is a dictator nonetheless. Uh, just my personal opinion about Danny. But like I said, I think she's a good person. But that's—I believe—that's what she is. She's a dictator. Um, and like I said, I'm not, uh, I'm not a rational Danny hater. Like I, I, she's she's definitely made concessions in uh, Marine, and I can respect that. You know, she's she is trying to get back in into their to their to their culture and stuff. You know, going back to their allowing some of their traditions. But here's some of my issues, or other issues other than that is I did not like the crucifying of the 163 masters in Marine without inv investigation or without trial. Yes, the masters were obviously not great people. They were slave masters. But we don't know exactly how many of those masters were directly responsible for crucifying the children on their on her march up to Marine. Um, we don't know who was against it amongst those whom were crucified. We don't know who were responsible. Uh, they needed to do some trialing or something other than just fire and blood, you know, her fire and blood vindication of just nailing people up on the cross without... Without trial, I, I that's one of the things. That's, that's one of the, the points that I really did not like about Daenerys is that one exactly. Uh, I know this occurred in the show only, but I also didn't like how she sacrificed the master to her two dragons without trial. I mean, that guy, he, who knows what? That guy might have been completely innocent, other than the fact of being a slave master. But he might have been completely innocent. He might have had three kids at home, and they're sitting at home. Oh, where's daddy? You know, I mean, sorry, kids. He was dragon food. But anyway, and going back to the slavery bait, you know, like America, you know, we, we had slaves. Other, a bunch of countries have had slaves. And there was internal, things happened internally. I mean, there was definitely some external forces working in some cultures. But it was mostly handled internally. Things changed over time. There wasn't a big fuss about it. Event, you know, eventually things have been, things have turned out for the good, of course. But... I just think a, a, a civilization has to evolve from within. That's that's my personal opinion. I know there's been plenty of countries that have been, you know, conquered throughout our history. I mean, obviously, it's happening. You know, America's done it. America did it with the uh, Native Americans. So I, there's definitely things that happen in our history that I don't agree with. So, and and the removal, you know, her, the first thing she did when she got into power was, like, strike down traditions, cultural identity. I, I didn't like that. But that's just my opinion. Obviously, you know, and I'll get into her pros right now, I think she's a good person. Very well-intentioned. Her motives seem genuine. And she's smart. She's smart. Her, her handling of Astapor. That, that was a, a brilliant, brilliant move against the Masters of Astapor. Uh, they were also extremely dumb for falling for it. But, you know, obviously she, she has some brains, too. Uh, another instance of content is the whole Quentin situation, you know. And I know she was being married to his daughter Zalorak, but I think she needs to make a hard line stance. She needs to decide whether she wants to toil around in Marine for another twenty years and wait for things to get perfect, or if she actually wants her main goal, which is to take back what she believes is hers, uh, and go and take Westeros. Quentin Martell was the perfect way to go and take Westeros. You get one of the major houses of, of Westeros on your side, you form a great alliance, but because he wasn't a good-looking guy, she makes a rash, a, an irrational decision on my, in my mind. By rebuffing him. Who cares about Marine and his Darzalorax? Screw that situation. 
get your ass to Westeros and do what you're supposed to do. I'm getting tired of her storyline. I'm sorry, I'm going to rant here, but I'm getting tired of her damn storyline and Marine. I'm done with it. It's time to move on. That being said, she should have taken the deal and got Marine on her side. Now, and I'm sorry about the dog barking. Apologize for that. Uh, and we're getting to the as we're getting to the end of the video, I'm going to talk about who I believe will be in the uh, at the end will be in a better position. That person, of course, is Danny, without a doubt. The show's messed me up on everything I've thought of. You know, I know I know they're separate entities, but it's got me messed up. That being said, I think Stannis is in for a tragic ending. Uh, I don't know if you guys heard of this before, but I believe he's had comparisons to Richard III from English history, War of Roses. And here are some of the comparisons. Richard III usurped the crown from his nephew. He claimed his nephews were legitimate. He was prior to this faithful and loyal servant to their father, who was his brother. After taking the crown, he was despised. After taking the crown, he tried to be just and fair and get things back in order. And of course, I believe Richard III, I'm pretty certain, was one of the last... He is the last king in English history to die in battle. And I think Stannis will die in battle. I'm not exactly sure of the exact circumstances. I'm hoping he dies valiantly. Well, I'm hoping he lives, but if he's going to die, which I believe he is, I hope he dies valiantly fighting the others. Would be a great fitting end to his story arc. And obviously I think Danny will, at the end will be in a better position at the end. I don't know if she's going to win the, the Iron Throne, but she will at, at the end be in the better position. So tell me what you guys think. Um, am I off base? Am I wrong? Uh, we can have civil conversation. Like I said, the impetus of this video was based off a civil conversation I had with Helene May. And um, she's a, I think she's a Danny fan. I'm, I'm obviously a Stannis fan. We had a civil conversation. So leave me a comment. I'll comment you back. We'll have a civil conversation. Hit like. Hit subscribe. Let me know what you guys think. All right, guys, that's all I got to say. And if I, I'm sure if I did, if I say anything wrong, you can point it out to me, and I will be happy to uh, answer those questions. Thanks, guys.